This week on Q&A, Dr. Tom Coburn, the Republican senator from Oklahoma, talks about his health, his time in both the House and Senate, the Affordable Health Care Act, and his relationship with President Obama, and his thoughts on the state of Congress and the country's financial situation. Senator Coburn has announced he'll retire when the current congressional session ends early next year. Actually, I think I'll just tear it up. Time we quit borrowing money against the future of our kids. It's time we quit mortgaging their future. It's time we start taking responsibility for the actions of the federal government. Has it happened? No. Why not? Uh, well, it's a human nature. Uh, it require, if, if you're going to do that, if you're going to actually really solve the problems, <clears throat> you have to go against your own political best judgment for being here, uh, which means you put at risk as a politician what you desire to continue, which is being a U.S. Senator or being a U.S. Congressman. It, it, I find it really counterintuitive when I talk to people at Oklahoma who don't agree with me a lot, but trust me. And, and that's what's happened is you see this real low approval rating of Congress. It's because they don't trust us, because we haven't given them reason to trust us. We haven't been honest with them about the real problems. And we haven't proffered solutions that will actually fix the real problems, even though there's pain. Pain's coming one way or the other. The question is, is do we manage the pain and the difficulties, or do we ignore them until they're here and suffer greater pain than what we would have otherwise. If you had to pen the tail on the donkey, when did this start in this country uh, in the last 50 years? Probably as, as we've had Supreme Court rulings that have widened and expanded the Commerce Clause and the General Welfare Clause. Uh, it, it fed into the nature of politicians to always want to be there to do something to make it right. The motivations of politicians are good. Generally, they're excellent. They, they want to do good things. They don't always want to do the hard right thing because how it will interfere with maybe their political career. Has that changed any in the last few years compared to the first 200 years? I don't think so. Uh, you know, it, it, I, think, I think that the people who are here are different. Uh, than originally the first 50 years of our country. You, you, <clears throat> the first 50 years of our country, you had people w with varied and large amounts of experience in life. And now we have limited experience in the political realm that concentrates the vast majority of people's experience that are here. In other words, they've known politics their entire life. And it's, it's noble to do that but it comes with limitations because you lack exposure and judgment. Uh, and the ability to discern proper values in terms of a long-term viewpoint versus a short-term viewpoint. You talked about, in the opening thing, about, uh, you know, you ripped up the credit card, talk, and then you talked about uh, the good people. Here's another clip of you back in, when we talked in 2007, when you had just come back to the Senate. Let's watch this. I'm sur sure with certain senators on certain times, there's, uh, these are great people. Uh, look, I, I have no problem with the greatness and the desire of most of the people that are here. The people in the Senate and the Congress are great people. We fall to the pressures of every, everybody else falls the same. Ours are just magnified because they're in the spotlight. But we're not any different. You talked about human nature and these are great people. How could they, they be great people if they're mortgaging the lives of their grandchildren and their grandchildren's grandchildren. Well, they don't have a perspective. Why not? Because they don't have the life experiences to have it, <clears throat> Brian. Is when, when you take the vast majority of members of Congress who've never done anything in their life but politics, they don't get the texture and granularity of, of difficulties, consequences, actions, all relating together. They, they miss that and therefore judgment becomes limited 
and, and so I, I don't fault them for that. That's, that. that's not their fault they don't have judgment, and that's why I've always said the way you fix Washington is change who's here and change it to where you have the vast majority of people aren't career politicians because now you bring a significant uh, repertoire of life experiences that are much different than the career politician to make those critical judgments about the future. Most Americans would, would not fall for a short-term gain with m aggravated long-term losses. But that's what we do every day in Washington. I mean, we've done it in the past, and we continue to do it this year. Uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's disappointing that we think about the short-term political scenario and never look at the underlying cause of the problem. We fix the symptoms, but we don't address the underlying cause. And, and the, to a fault, we do that on almost everything that comes before us because we want to put fires out rather than prevent the next fire. Elected three times to the U.S. House, twice to the United States Senate, both times you put your own term limits on you. But this time around, you have Resign, you're going to resign from the Senate at the end of this year. Why? It, it's, well, in my life, <clears throat> uh, made a lot of decisions, a lot of different ways, but what I've really come to know is my reaction and my fitting in the situation I'm in, and when it's time for me to do something different, it becomes very obvious to me. Uh, I'd say my patience is wearing thin with the way Congress works. Uh, and, and I'm not leaving to just leave. I, I'm going to work very hard on trying to get a con convention of the states. Uh, I'm actually convinced that the only way we really repair uh, what was in originally intended is to have a convention of the states. So <clears throat> I'm bowing out of the Senate, but I'm not bowing out of the debate. Back in 2003, when you had a book, you weren't in Congress at the time. You were a civilian. Here's something you had to say about your own personal condition. What was what was the year that you got your cancer? Uh, well, actually, I've had two. Uh, the first year was 1970, I guess, six or seven. It's been a long time. What Hard time to, was it? It was melanoma, and uh, had a complete recovery from that. What and was that impact on you? How old you, How old were you at the time? I think it was. Tw 26, 27, uh, it had a big impact on my life. It changed my perspective. Uh, I, I looked at my business and what I wanted to do with my life differently and uh, actually eventually led me into going into medicine. Uh, I got interested in intraocular lenses. We were the first people to make those in this country and uh, got so enthused I thought I wanted to be an ophthalmologist. And then when I found out you could do everything, I didn't want to be an ophthalmologist anymore. I wanted to do everything. And so I'm really just an old time GP. It's not often that uh, somebody who's not a doctor gets to ask a doctor about their own health condition, but there you were with melanoma, followed by colon cancer. Then you had prostate cancer a couple years ago, and it's returned. Mm -hmm. How much did that impact the decision to None. step down? No, no, matter of, <clears throat> no, I made this decision about four months before I ever found out I had a recurrence. So uh, the, 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 the recurrence of the cancer didn't have anything to do with my decision. Well, What's it like to be a doctor and know so much about the body and find yourself going through three different cancers on one return? Oh, you know, I don't think uh, being a doctor really uh, it's beneficial because you understand the pathology, you understand the physiology of it, you understand the scientific journals and the possible outcomes probably better. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that would work into my faith more than it works into my uh, knowledge as a physician. Uh, you know, I, I'm a fighter. Uh, I'm going to take every advantage of every tool I can, uh, and I, uh, I'll whip this present situation, uh, and I have full confidence that I'll do that. It'll just take me some time to do it. Uh, but it's kind of another hiccup along the road, and it's also a confirming thing that says you made the right decision in terms of leaving Congress. Uh, because I can apply more effort uh, to getting that taken care of when I'm not in Congress than I can while I am in Congress. Can you tell us what you have to do to take care of it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> it, it's complicated because I have a, a fairly rare type of prostate cancer, and it, it's going to involve ultimately surgeries. 
and, uh, and uh, uh, chemical therapies, and I'm undergoing some of that now. Uh, but I'm moving along, and it doesn't knock me back much. When would you? When do we have to have the surgeries? Well, it depends on numbers. Uh, probably this spring. So before you leave, uh huh? Yeah. And after that, do you have to go to chemotherapy again? Well, it'll depend on what the outcome is and what the numbers are. It, you know, uh, recurrent prostate cancer is kind of a chronic disease. We have wonderful. Uh, wonderful therapies that can prolong life for a great long period of time and multitude if this doesn't work then you got another shot at another drug and another method and we have a combination of radiation therapy and chemotherapies that uh, and I'm in great hands I'm at MD Anderson and got one of the leading uh, uro oncologists in the world Dr. Logothetis and uh, and so got a lot of confidence in them and uh, I'm a pretty good patient when it says follow what they say to do. Will it slow you down? Well, the surgery will for a while, but after that, no. If I remember correctly, you've been married for over 45 years. I have. You've got three daughters. Three grown daughters. I've got a, <clears throat> a granddaughter graduating high school this year, going to college. So I've got them from 18 years of age all the way down to 18 months. So what is, what's the family's reaction to you? all the activities you're involved in, being a senator, and now fighting this other battle? Oh, <clears throat> well, I think I'd separate it, too. One, it's sometimes hard to be a senator's grandchild or child. <clears throat> uh, you get hit with people who don't like what I do or how I do it. Uh, the other side, I think they have a lot of confidence that, that uh, you know, I'm <clears throat> pretty honest about where I am and what I'm going to do, and, uh, and I think that's reassuring. Uh, real comfortable where I am. As you know, a lot of people in town think you're quitting because of the cancer. I know, and they, I can't send enough <laughs> reports back out saying what you said in your story isn't true. You know, it's just not true. <clears throat> I told the, the, the minority leader in March or April of last year that I was leaving. And so he's known it all that period of time until the time I announced. Is this it for you as far as public office is concerned? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, there's a lot of things I want to do. Uh, uh, I want to allocate better time uh, to things that are more important personally in my personal life, in terms of my wife, my children, my grandchildren. Uh, I want to uh, allocate more time to uh, 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 actually loving people, actually trying to make a difference in other people's lives one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reward that comes from that when you can actually reach down and help somebody. So I, uh, I, 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 it's, I'm anxious to walk through any door I'm supposed to walk through, uh, regardless of the consequences or the costs. Uh, I'm just wait, I can't wait to get to the next door. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about leaving and, and seeing what life has for me after I leave here. Is there something you want to accomplish here before you leave? Oh, there's a lot of things I'd like to accomplish. It will depend on whether we can get them in bills and, and through bills, but a lot of reforms are starting to happen, stuff I've been working on for six or eight years. People are starting to pay attention to now, so we'll see if we get some of those things done. My hope would be that we do. Uh, working across the aisle pretty hard on a lot of those things right now. Back to 2007 again when you were here, you were a United States Senator, and you were talking about the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006. Yeah. Probably the most important thing that's happened in the last two years is the, the uh, Transparency and Accountability Act, uh, which is going to expose to every American to how we spend our money. And you're going to be able to follow it down through subcontractors and subgrantees, and um, the individual Americans going to know where earmarks go and who got the money, and who sponsored them, and where all the money goes, what defense contractor, you know, all the way down to sub. We're going to be able to know that. When? Well, the first part of it starts January of 2008. <clears throat> subcontractees will be 2000, uh, 2008, nine months later. Everything will be online and finished by October of 2008. Has that been signed by the president, or did it have to Yes, be? sir. It has been signed. Uh, was was signed that your a, bill? That was my bill. Who was on it with you? Barack Obama. Is it there? It's not where we want it to be. <clears throat> it needs to be improved. <clears throat> uh, uh, the compliance with the agencies is a real problem. The accuracy of the data is a real problem. 
Uh, but there's a couple of things coming that are going to make that better. One's the Data Act, and one another's the Taxpayer Right to Know Act. Um, and so my hope would be that those will come through this year, <clears throat> and what they'll do is together. Uh, we'll not only know the data where the money's spent, but we'll know all the programs. Most of the agencies don't even know their programs, don't even know how many programs they have, let alone how much money they spend on them, and whether or not they're making a difference. <clears throat> So the combination of those together uh, ultimately will make a difference. Uh, but you're not going to, you know, we can't fix this here, Brian. Uh, it's not fixable with members of Congress and an executive branch. It requires some changes to the Constitution to reestablish the balance of power between the branches. The executive branch has all the power, and we can write in bills, you will do this, and there's no consequences if they don't. And so we're totally out of balance in terms of what our founders thought uh, we should have. And so, you know, some of the things, uh, you know, in a constitutional convention would be giving Congress the power to say, you're going to issue all these regulations, going to have this great impact on the economy. It really doesn't match with what our intention was in the legislation. So therefore, we get a right to veto that, <clears throat> to rebalance the power so that if you have a $100 million effect in the economy, Maybe Congress ought to bless that or say, no, that's not the way to go. And part of that is Congress's problem because we don't write bills specific enough. We don't direct. What we do is we're lazy. We write bills with an intention and then allow administrations to figure it out, and which tells you that we don't know enough about what we're talking about if we can't write the details of what we expect. I got on the OMB website trying to find this Accountability Act information. It was nowhere on the home page. Uh, eventually no, you got, got to, to go to usspending.gov. Yeah, I eventually got to <clears throat> data.gov. Is that it? I don't know if they've changed the name to it. No, you can go to usaspending.gov and should be able to should send you right there. When I did get to <coughs> data.gov on that website, it, there were 92,000 data points in the, mm -hmm. in the in the in the uh, on the website. What does that tell you? 92,000 data points. Let me read to you what I also found on the OMB website, Accountable Government Initiative, the Obama Administration's Campaign to Cut Waste and Improve Results, June of 2011. Here's the first couple sentences. All across America, families and businesses are finding ways to live within their means, eliminating not only wasteful expenses, but even some ways that are desirable, but not essential. The federal government is doing the same thing focusing on how we can cut waste, get the most from taxpayer dollars, and reform how the government works so the American people get the best possible service. Well, I think, first of all, I give credit to the Obama administration. Uh, they have put in multitude of their budgets ideas that are good ideas, things we've been proposing for years, totally ignored by Congress. Uh, I would also say the people at OMB uh, 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 the director of OMB and her assistant uh, for management are the real deal. We finally have some real professional business people with real experience in the real world working for the Obama administration. Stop just a second and tell us what the OMB is for Office somebody. Office of Management and Budget. But what is that? How does that fit? Well, they have they have power. Uh, they write the budgets. They have authority over the agencies for compliance and transparency and also reporting. Uh, so, so they have, if, if you're a president, your key area besides your cabinet is having the strongest person possible in at OMB because that's where the teeth are for the administration to cause agencies to become compliant with what the administration would will. And you say she's the real deal. This yes. new, uh, how, give us a reason why she's the real deal. Well, she comes, number one is, is she's transparent. Uh, she's not a turf protector. Uh, Sylvia Burwell's her name. Uh, she uh, uh, is, uh, communicates and doesn't hold back. In other words, there's nothing, there's nothing about her other than what you see is what you get. You, you have, uh, t she and Beth Cobert, who is the uh, uh, management uh, under secretary uh, uh, and director uh, are a team uh, who have great experience outside of government in private sector 
And what they're doing is applying that private sector technology and knowledge and organization and structure to the Office of Management and Budget, which then will bleed out. So my compliments uh, to the President for his judgment in the selecting of those two individuals because I think it's going to make a big difference. Here's a, a, another sentence or two. Reforming, this is from the OMB <coughs> website. Reforming how Washington works is an ongoing effort that demands vigilance and leadership. To build on the accomplishments detailed below, the president has asked the vice president to take the reins of the administration's reform efforts and lead its campaign to cut waste, an initiative to hunt down misspent tax dollars through the government. Has the vice president done that? I don't know. Uh, you know, I can't comment on uh, what he has or hadn't done. Uh, what I can tell you is here's what the GAO says, is we're wasting $200 billion a stop, year. Stop again. GAO. Government Accountability Office. What, who does that answer to? That answers to Congress. Uh, they are Congress's arm to look at everything. And so four years ago, I put in with one of the debt limit increases a mandate that the GAO had to study every aspect of government and tell us identify duplication and waste. Now they do wonderful jobs on all these other things, but I mandated that they have. So this month, the fourth report will come out and they show all these different areas where we have multitude of programs doing exactly the same thing, layered over. Job training is one where we have 47 programs spending $18 billion and all but three do exactly the same thing. They overlap with no no metrics to measure whether or not they're effective. So, so what we've done is through the last four years, GAO has built up this list. And so you got $200 billion worth of duplicative programs. And those are our numbers as we assess that, that Congress hadn't acted on. House acted on one thing called the Skills Act, where they took 30-some job training programs, put them into one, put metrics on it, and send it back to the states. Because what we do know is the states run job training programs far better than the federal government and much more effectively to give somebody a life skill. So <clears throat> we, we have not done one major thing in Congress to address what GAO has raised, which goes back to our first conversation as we started this. Why not? If there really is $200 billion there and we're borrowing $750 billion, $800 billion this year from our kids, why wouldn't we lessen that by streamlining those programs and putting metrics? Well, why not then? Because Congress is lazy. Because all those programs have a constituency. But you told me and us that they're great people. Well, they are. But How can you be great people when you're mortgaging again, I'll say it again, the uh, future uh, of your grandchildren? Because they lack the judgment to see what they're doing. They're blinded by their own uh, ambition. Well, then I want to stop just a second and ask you what a great person is. Well, a great person is, is I'm not questioning their motives, I'm questioning their lack of experience. That's the difference, is, is if you continue to send people here who have no real worldly experience, no real hardship, <clears throat> no real difficulty, no real successes in life outside of politics, you're going to continue to get the same results. That's why I think we need a constitutional convention that'll put term limits. You know, once you put term limits on, you, you eliminate a lot of the careerism that goes on here. The other thing, that will open up lots more seats for a lot more people who actually have real world experience to be competitive in terms of coming up here to fix this. But that's only one part of what you can do to fix, fix the government. You're not going to fix it in Washington today. I'm con literally convinced of that. I've, I, I will have spent 16 years in Congress and I continue to be disappointed every day at the lack of foresight, the lack of judgment, uh, the lack of long-term thinking, and the lack of critical uh, decision-making that occurs in Congress. If you had it to do over again, I know you don't, but if you had it to do over again, would you go to Congress or and the Senate? Oh, uh, you know, I've been tremendously blessed by some of the friendships that have come out of this. So for that or no other reason, just the, the acquaintances and longtime life friends that I will have had three or four especially, uh, <clears throat> it's been worth it. Uh, it's been a tremendous sacrifice in terms of earning power outside of here because it's really a, a, a different level in terms of it's taking 16 years out of the most productive areas of my time of my life, uh, you know, has made a big difference in terms of what my future. The was. first time around when you were in Congress, you said you took no benefits. Did you do the same thing the second time with the Senate? No, I didn't. I, I participated in the uh, thrift savings plan. Why? 
uh, because I needed it. I needed some type of retirement program. But as you know, you've told us you delivered over 4,000 babies in your life as a medical doctor. Would you have been better off if you just stayed doing that? I don't know. I, you know, I, uh, that's a hard question for me to. Uh, I guess somebody will have to answer that after I've gone. You know, the the fact is, is it, what it, it, the the question really comes down: Have you can you assess? Did you make a difference? Uh, I think I've elevated the debate and raised the questions. The question it then comes is: Has any action come out of that? And I don't know. Are you going to go back to practicing medicine? No. Why not? You can't practicing medicine today in the environment that we have is, is the joy of medicine is gone. I talk to my partners all the time, and they're struggling uh, with the mandates of the federal government and the mandates of the insurance industry. Uh, uh, the pleasure of being able to take care of somebody and have the judgment to do what you know needs to be done versus checking with some bureaucrat somewhere, uh, it's gone. Here you are in 2013 talking about medical. Which just brings us back to the integrity of the statements of the president. What did he say? We've seen all sorts of rationalization everything. If you like your insurance now you got, you can keep it. Is that right? Well, right now for 5,800,000 and soon to be 15 million Americans, that isn't true. They knew it wasn't true when they said it, but it sounded good. Second deceitful thing, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor, period. Oh, really? Deceitful. It is. But that's your friend, President Obama. Yeah, well. I mean, you're in effect he's, saying he he's lied. not perfect. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But when it came to this law, you know, uh, uh, their motivations to fix health care, I don't doubt, were pure. What we had was a mess. The problem is, is they went the wrong direction. And so now we have a bigger mess. Uh, when you look at some of the surveys of our best doctors, those in their late 40s and early 50s, and you survey them, you're going to see tons of retirement. Because we went the other way. What we should have done is gone in a way that created some of the same safety nets, put the same limitations in terms of uh, continuing illnesses and all the rest, and done it to where we have market forces allocating resources. And consequently, you know, we, we, we had over 5 million people lose their insurance. Uh, about 1.8 million of those re-signed up at a higher cost, three quarters of them at a higher cost. We put a lot of people on Medicaid, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but when you're promising access to somebody for care and don't have the facilities there to give it to them, you haven't given them anything other than say you've got Medicaid, uh, I think we went the wrong direction. So I, I don't question their motives, uh, but the politics behind it were pretty rough and pretty inaccurate, uh, and, and it was untrue. We, again, I don't mean to beat this drum, but I'm doing it. Great people. Here we are, governments, according to you and others, lying to us. Just members of Congress and the Senate and the administration and every lying, just not telling the truth. And the trust in government is way down, as you know, in every poll yeah. that you see. When does when do they when do we slap something on them other than great? Well. You've hung up on my word. When I'm talking about great, I don't think they're necessarily stellar individuals. They're they're great human beings. You know, it, it, as but I they're died, cheating the public by lying <clears> them. <throat> that's right. Uh, there's no question that Congress routinely, administrations routinely don't speak the truth to the American public, and it's not just about inaccuracies on terms of what the Afford Affordable Health Care Act would do. It's the absence of speaking the truth about where we are. Where are we? We are now at a standard of living the same as what we had in 1988. We now have, per family, unfunded obligations and pure debt of $1.1 million per family. That needs to be spoken. 
so that we can build the context for the tough things that are going to come. You know, the, the biggest problem that I see with Congress is its denial of reality. Uh, and, and you can still be a good person and deny reality. We all have flaws and we all deny realities in some sense in our lives every day because we don't want to face them. Uh, but the fact is, is we haven't had the leadership in this country in a long time, and I'm talking presidential and congressional, that would stand up and tell the truth to the American public about the s situation we find ourselves in. And you can debate what caused it. I, I pretty well have my idea of what caused it. What? And in terms of careerism, in terms of getting elected at all costs, regardless, it, you know. And so what we've done, Brian, is we've lost legitimacy. We're not legitimate. We're illegitimate because we fail to speak the truth about where we find ourselves. But where, stop a second, just where, where do you put the blame on that, though? Something had to happen. We haven't been this way for 250 years. Well, we, no, but we, we've lacked some great, great leadership. Uh, you but know, why? Why is, the, is Do you blame the public? Well, I think there's a cultural decline in our country. Why? But, but well, I can't, I can't uh, you know, I'm not a sociologist. I can't give you the answer. I can tell you my observations. As, as I think as more and more people have walked away from some type of faith at all, where there's a set of rules and a set of uh, parameters of which you live your life by, I think that makes it easier to, to walk away from valued principles that would speak. Most uh, politicians wrap themselves in the faith uh, issue, God, you know, on both sides. Well, you know, it isn't about what you say. It's about what you do. It's like Edward Guest's poem is, I'd rather see a sermon lived than spoken any day. You know, that's a paraphrase of what he said. And the proof is in how you live your life. It's not what you say. And people get that. I mean, <clears throat> the American voter is not stupid. The question is, they have limited choices. They have limited choices. They have a choice of a career Republican or a career Democrat most of the time. Uh, rather than a leader. You know, I got into politics never having been in it before, uh, which means you can do it, but it's difficult. And so that's why I think term limits will, will change some of this. But again, that's not the answer. The, 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 the answer is real leadership, speaking the real truths that the American people already know. They just don't have the, the focus on the details of what they know. They don't trust us because we haven't earned their trust. They don't trust us because we've been deceitful as we've talked to them. They don't trust us because we've been expedient as we've dealt with them. Uh, they don't trust us because of the actions of the typical person whose primary motive is to get reelected, not to fix the country. And most people will vote for somebody even though they disagree with them if they trust them and think they're trying to do the right thing. Speaking of the trust, what is the status of your friendship with Barack Obama? Uh, I, th I think it's fine. Uh, I either talk to him or uh, write him a note or he writes me a note uh, or we communicate one way or another uh, a couple of times a month. Uh, uh, it's been rough because I, you know, I have significant disagreements uh, with the president and his policies. Uh, but I've tried to be respectful uh, uh, of the office and uh, at the same time uh, supporting him when I can. And I do a lot. Uh, you know, when he does good things, I try to praise him. What was the source of your friendship in the first place? Just, we, we kind of fell together as we came into the Senate. And, uh, you know, I was kind of persona non grata when I came to the Senate because of my reputation in the House. And he was kind of wondering. We just kind of sat down started visiting. And we, we did a little bit as we came through uh, orientation together. But then we, we talked. I mean, I talked with him when he was planning his run for the presidency. And, you know, I, we, we've just continued. Uh, I personally very much liked the man, uh, adamantly disagree with the policies. But he's a very likable guy when you get to know him. And that's the side that most conservatives have never seen. And so the question is, can you dislike the policies and still like the man? And the question is yes. That's the same, same with when you say people are great in the Senate. There's a lot of nice guys in the Senate, but I abhor what they speak and what they stand for because I find it to be untruthful in my judgment. Here's the president at the National Prayer Breakfast talking about you. Uh, and then there is one uh, colleague of mine who 
is, is missing today. Uh, a great friend of mine who I came into the Senate with, uh, Senator Tom Coburn. Uh, Tom's going through, through some uh, tough times right now, uh, but I love him dearly, even though we're from different parties. and uh, He's a little closer to, to Louis's uh, uh, political perspective than mine, uh, but uh, he is a good man, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm keeping him and his family in, in, uh, in my prayers all the time. So just a shout out to uh, my good friend Tom Coburn. Did you know he did that? I knew it after the fact, yeah. Um, again, people outside of Washington don't understand. They just don't get how all of you can be friends and you can stand up on the floor of the Senate and say people aren't telling the truth and you can accuse this president of, you, you haven't pointed your finger at him directly, but of not telling the truth when it comes to the health care bill. Uh, and w do you think that he said to the American people, you can keep your health care plan, you can keep your doctor, on, and he knew differently? I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know the details about it, <clears throat> uh, but I can tell he was poorly advised if he didn't. Uh, and that's the whole point. Is, is, you know, in politics you get wrapped up in what you believe, and that's why it's important to have people around you who will challenge your perspective and your thought. But uh, nobody has lost their job in this administration, in this town, over anything. I, I think it's atrocious. And I don't know uh, that many people lost I mean, their people jobs during my the Bush administration have, either. People of my staff have lost their job. You know, it, it, it's, it's a different way of running things. Uh, 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 you know, it, what the, I think what the American people are looking for is, is culpability. You know, will you be culpable about what you profess and what you're in charge of? And uh, I, I don't, we, we, we want to run away from that. What do you think of what you see in Wall Street? I think there's some of the same problem. Power, look, it's, it's about power, Brian. Uh, how you utilize power is a reflection of your character, of who you are. Uh, if you use power to beat people up versus using power to bring people together, you know, one of my biggest digs with the president is I think our country right now, more than any time in its past, needs a letter, leader that brings us together rather than accentuates our divisions. But he would say it's the Republicans that... Yeah, I, under, I understand. Uh, how do you everybody bring, points fingers. Yeah, but how but do you bring people together? Leadership with, that says, I don't care what people think about me. What my job is is to bring people together to solve problems. Have you ever gone to Mitch McConnell, for instance, in the Senate and said, you need to help bring us together? Oh, yeah. What's he say? Well, the times that I've done it, have uh, part of that's personal. I won't reveal the, those conversations. Part times I've done it uh, uh, in caucuses and other things, the reaction was not positive. What happens behind the scenes when there's a personal difference, you know, where people don't like each other, same party, same caucus? Uh, I don't know. I think it's probably like any other group dynamic. Uh, you know, people get their nose out of, you know, it's kind of like when you have a fight with your brother, he's still your brother. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the deal is, is, you know, the one thing that I've learned in life, uh, and, it was, and it was written in the 1890s, I think, Annie Christensen wrote this. She said, when you forgive somebody, you set somebody free. And the person you set free is yourself. And so the idea of holding a grudge or not letting it go and not reconciling with people is an anathema to making this place work. And, and so very little of that happens. Most of it gets swallowed. Uh, but what really has to do is you need a leader that says, we're going to reconcile our problems. And we're going to deal with them. And you, you need active leadership in terms of modeling a behavior that says, you know, most of the time when people are, are feel, feel uh, aggrieved or injured, they attest a motive of intention to it. Whereas in my life, what I've found when I've gone to reconcile with people is there was no motive of intention most of the time. And so, you know, it's how people see things differently. And so communication, that life runs on communication. Uh, and that's why that skill is so important in terms of communicating and, and, and pushing towards reconciliation. Even if it's not possible, at least the, the effort towards it calms things down. So behind the scenes, 
behind the scenes, there's times things get rough, people get their feelings hurt, but most of the times those get solved. What, and, what's and the I, worst thing that's been done? I don't know, this, this sounds maybe the wrong way to ask it. It's been done to you because people didn't like what you were doing behind the scenes. Oh, I don't know. I don't even keep track of it. I let it. Well, on that note, let's watch this clip of you and another senator, deceased senator, on the floor of the United States Senate. Now, all I want to do is uh, sir, put the Senate on notice. I've been asked several times today, will I, will I agree to this, uh, this version or that version of the Senator's Oklahoma Amendment? No! No, I will not, unless it treats all states the same way. And praise God, I have the energy to do what I must, uh, may have to do to prove the Senator from Oklahoma I mean what I say. This amendment's not going to pass. The Senate is warned. It's wrong to do this to any state. It's wrong to put two colleagues in a position where we'd have to go home and explain why couldn't we prevent an amendment doing to our state what's never been done to another state. Never. Now, this is not the time to start this process. And I'd urge my friend from Oklahoma to reconsider this, to reconsider what he's getting us into. The amendment may pass, but if it does, the bill will never pass. If it does, I'll be taken out of here on a stretcher. That was 2005. You remember that moment? Mm -hmm. Sure do. Was that the real thing? Was he the real thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, but he, he, he was speaking on what he believed, that Congress gets to divvy up the goodies and send them home. And, you know, the, the very bill, he's right, the amendment didn't pass, but we got rid of earmarks because I offered that amendment. I mean, that was what started the American people's just absolute rejection of this political game playing where we're spending everybody's money to make the politicians look good. Uh, but, you know, the, following up on reconciliation, I reconciled with Ted Stevens after that. I bought him a box of 50 cigars. I had a great time with him. He'd call me up and said, come on down to the beach and have a cigar. I mean, you know, he, he was very angry, but I reconciled that. We had a great relationship after that. What did you think of what happened to him? He was indicted and convicted in a court of law. Wrongly. You say wrongly. Yeah. Why? Well, it was the, well, the, the attorney, general, attorney general threw it out. But yeah, it, but the prosecutorial malfeasance in that, if you read the record, it was wrong. It was wrong. It was political in nature. It was wrong in nature. Political uh, on the part of who? Of the prosecutors. You know, uh, uh, the question is, 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 Ted Stevens was a character. He was part of an institution. He did a lot of great things for this country. Uh, and and uh, even though I had a markedly different viewpoint on how we should not use earmarks to feather our own nest to make ourselves look good at, at home and that we can actually take this money and do a better job for the country as a whole, uh, he benefited the country a great deal while he was here. And what they did was sour the end of a career that was, I don't believe, was just in any way. As a matter of fact, if you looked at the testimony, if you just take an imbalance of the prosecut prosecutorial malfeasance in the testimony, he didn't really do anything wrong. But it, he did enough wrong to cause him to lose election, which I think was a reason for it in the first place. Here's another moment in your career in the United States Senate. This was on our Colin show here. If you want to ask why the Senate isn't working, there's one reason. It's called Harry Reid. Incompetent and incapable of carrying on the tradition of the Senate. I wanted to come to the floor to talk about two or three subjects. The first is to issue an apology to the majority leader. I don't apologize for my frustration of this place, but occasionally my words are harsh and inaccurate, and uh, uh, this past week I used words that were inappropriate uh, uh, in describing his actions in the Senate, and for that I offer a public apology. I do not apologize for how I think the Senate is being run and the damage that I think it's, is being done to the country. Uh, but as an individual, he has a very difficult time, and I understand that, and to him I ask uh, his forgiveness. As an individual, he has a very difficult time. What did you mean? Well, being majority leader is a tough job. Why? Uh, because you, you have the polls of your own caucus, which is fairly divided, and the polls of the minority, and the polls of the president, who has an agenda uh, that he has to try to shepherd. 
And so you're in the midst of it. Uh, my criticisms of him really are in terms of protecting the institution, not leading to protect the institution, uh, and allowing the, the institution to function. Uh, and, and I address most of that to what he's required to do politically rather than policy-wise, but the damage to the, the institution. You know, why did we have a bicameral legislature? Why did our founders set that up? They didn't want two houses. They wanted a house that was really responsive to the citizenship. And they wanted another house where you protected the rights of minority, but you also had long-term thinking, reasoned thought, and less politics in nature. And we, we've gotten away from that. We almost have two houses of representatives now, which will in the long term be a detriment to the country because we'll do this more often. The whole function of the Senate was to make it really hard for us to make major changes in the country so that we wouldn't do this, so that we would do this. And, and I don't think he's been a great shepherder of, of the Senate, its traditions, or its operations. What would you say if you think of Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader, Harry Reid, the Democratic leader in the Senate, John Boehner in the House, um, Nancy Pelosi, how did they get to be leaders? Uh, you know, I haven't ever spent any time thinking about that. But I mean, Brian. what's it take to be a leader in these bodies, in these institutions? <clears throat> well, being there a long time is one. Uh, number two, uh, uh, creating indebtedness. Uh, number three, uh, sometimes speaking a vision. Uh, I don't see much of that anywhere. Uh, and that's one of the things I think is sorely lacking. Can you remember the moment you said, <clears throat> and tell, tell us who you said it to, your wife or whoever, uh, I'm getting out. Oh yeah, I started talking to my wife and one of my best friends back home in Oklahoma. Uh, what triggered it? Uh, a recognition of the limits of what I thought I could accomplish and could I accomplish more. <clears throat> in other words, you know, you and I aren't exactly the same age, but we're definitely in the down portion of our I'm slope. Just a little older than you, yes. Yeah, we're <laughs> in the down portion of our slope and you start measuring how do I make, how do I make the biggest influence? How, how do I do the most good? How do I accomplish the greatest uh, benefit for the most people? And you combine that, questioning that, with your level of frustration and really it's, it's more disappointment. It's, it's less frustration and more disappointment in the actions of people who know better, but choose to make a political decision that is good for them may not necessarily be good for the country, but it fits their personal plan. What was your wife's reaction when you told her you were leaving? Whew. Just make sure you get a different job. You're not coming home to stay. Not really. She, uh, my wife was happy about it. Being gone, you know, I go home on Thursday or Friday come back on Monday mornings and have done it for nine plus years in the Senate. Uh, so being gone is, is really falls on your spouse and your family for a lot of things. I'll never forget when I came home from the, from the house after six years. It, it's a real adjustment because your wife takes over a lot of things that you don't even think about and you want to try to get back into that decision-making mode and all of a sudden you know, there's a potential for conflict there. But we worked it out fine, it ran smoothly. But uh, the point is, is, is one of the things, uh, you know, I talk about great people. Great people do make some sacrifices. And when you're in the Senate, you sacrifice your family. There is no question about it. You are putting them second. And so one of the things I hope to do is to remedy some of that. When but I there ahead. wasn't a moment where you said, this is it, I'm no, going. No. But I get in all these confirmation moments now as I see what the Senate's doing. I say, you know, I'm so glad I'm not going to be a part of failing to be straightforward with the American people. One of the subjects you've talked a lot about, and this was just recently in March, the end of March, you made this comment on the Senate floor talking about the doc fix. Let's watch 50 seconds. Uh, the bill we have on the floor <clears throat> uh, is one of the reasons why I'm leaving Congress at the end of this year. Uh, because here's 
and here's why the american people are disgusted with us where we're going to put off to tomorrow what we should be doing today we should be fixing this problem instead of delaying the problem i concur a lot with what my colleague from virginia said but the fact is is there's no courage there's no guts there's no intentioned actions to do what is the best thing in the long term for this country in this body anymore. What are you talking about? And, and how do you explain it to the, I mean, we've, this has gone on for 16 years? I think that what I'm talking about is, I'll, I'll put it in the medicine analogy. If you come in to see me and you're sick and you've got a cough and a fever and a little bit of pain in your chest, I can give you something to take the fever away. I can give you something to fix the cough and alleviate the pain. So I will have treated your symptoms. But the underlying cause is, is that you have a right middle lobe pneumonia. And until I give you antibiotics, treating the symptoms is just going to cover up the problem. And that's what Congress does all the time. It's sickening. They refuse to recognize and discern what the underlying problem is. They treat the symptoms, and this will be back in 13 months. The other thing. But what is it? Explain it, what it, it is. The sustainable growth rate formula is a formula on how we pay doctors. And so they were getting ready to have a big cut because it was started in 1997 as a way to try to control Medicare costs. So we continue to not control Medicare costs by not having the cuts to the doctors, and it's grown to a very huge amount because we've continued to delay the program. We've delayed fixing the real problem for 16 times. Should, Six should doctors have Medicare costs cut to them, I mean, Medicare expenses to them? What, what doctors should have is a say in how we go forward to control the costs of Medicare. And the point I made in that speech on the floor was, we pay doctors wrongly for care. We pay them by code. And what we've done is decrease the quality of medicine because we won't allow a doctor to spend the amount of time they need to with you to actually find out what's going on. And because they're paid by code. So they've got to see so many people to get enough code to pay their overhead and pay a salary every day. Rather than paying doctors like, how much, how much time did I spend with Brian Lamb to really get to know, to really figure out what he is. The first axiom in medicine that every doctor is taught, if you will listen to your patient, they will tell you what is wrong with them. Now, it takes some time to develop that skill, but you can't. But that takes time. And when the average time before a patient's interrupted by a doctor is six seconds in this country, you can see we're missing out on the first axiom of Explain medicine. Explain that one. Well, we've studied it. When you come in to see the doctor and they say, well, why are you here today? And they're sitting there, not eye contact with you, they're sitting there looking at the chart, what the nurse wrote down, and you start into it six seconds after that, they start asking you questions. And the reason they're asking you questions is because they need to hurry up and finish with you so they can get to the next patient. So what we've done is incentivized them not to practice the art of medicine. The reason we know this is true, if you take Kaiser Permanente out on the West Coast where their doctors are paid a salary and doesn't have anything to do, what they do is they actually spend a lot more time with patients and they order a whole lot fewer tests per patient. So the cost of care for that patient and the, the time to a correct diagnosis is shorter. So we're actually develop, getting better health care when we change the incentives for doctors, and yet we're not doing that. We're not even looking at it. We're still stuck on this mode because there's no leadership and there's no forward thinking about what is the real problem rather than addressing here's the symptoms, here's the hot button issue, we can't let this happen, therefore we're going to fix it and do a short term fix. Well we've known this was coming up for a year. We had a year to fix it, but there's no leadership to have fixed it. So it, it, that's the kind of thing that is so disappointing where you have the authority as a committee chairman to actually make a difference and you don't carry out the assets that are given you as a committee chairman to actually solve some of these problems, that's disappointing. If you step outside of the town, though, and look at the whole town, both Republicans and Democrats, you see Congress, the Senate and the House, 
spending a third of their time, supposedly, this is what everybody says, raising money for their next campaign. And you see the President of the United States getting on a 747 and flying all over the United States to raise money at the same time doing something else that will pay for that trip, which is a tremendous amount of time. Why doesn't everybody just stay put for a while and figure out a way to do it without spending millions and millions of Leadership. dollars? Nobody has the confidence to, the, uh, what I would tell you is we lack character-centered leadership in this country that says it's okay to lose if we're doing the best things for the country. Because we're so divided politically uh, from a policy standpoint that we haven't had the character come forward and lead our country that says, you know, Whatever happens, every American's going to take part in it. And so therefore, we ought to have the leadership that brings us together, that is honest about what our difficulties are, that puts forward plans and says, come on, let's, let's, let's work this together. How much of this is the media's fault? Oh, and, uh, media typically wants to see a fight, and so they exaggerate it. You know, people talk to me all the time about uh, what's going on in the Senate. My, I'd say my relationships are across the aisle are as good or better than they've always been. I think that's true with most uh, uh, people in the Senate. So what you, the storyline you hear is very different than what's actually going on. If you listen to the conservative radio shows, they, no matter what President Obama does, these are your friends. Well, they come I, out. I'm not sure they're my friends. Well, they come, they come out, though, right after it. Every single time he does anything, he's wrong. Well, nobody's wrong all the time. That's the first thing. Number two is, is, is both sides exaggerate the differences. Uh, both sides exaggerate. Again, what it takes is a real leader. You know, I, I was criticized by, by saying one time you can't believe everything Fox News says. You can't? No, you can't. And the point is, is if you want to balance, you need to listen to both ends of the spectrum. If you want input and knowledge and hear the whole story, you know, that's one of the times, one of the reasons sometimes on an issue I'll have both sides come in so I can hear both sides of the issue. What issue have you changed your mind on? Oh, there's a lot of things I've, I've, I've given on. Um, uh, but I think that's more trying to get something accomplished uh, then it, you know, I can't have my way. There, you know, my way isn't the right way. It's just my way, and so something less than that is is good, uh, as long as we actually are thinking long term instead of short term. Uh, what is going to be your last day in the Senate? Whenever our last day in session is. So it could be January third, or it could be in December. I don't know. And they're electing a new senator. Uh huh. For the two years remaining in my term. What's the first thing you're going to do when you no longer are attached to this town? Well, if it's December, January, I'm probably going to sneak off to Colorado and be in the snow and the mountains and, and uh, start really planning what I want to do. Another book? I don't think so. Uh, if I do, it won't be a political-based book. It will be more faith-based book. I'm thinking about writing a book about anxiety, worry, and depression. Uh, I've seen a lot of that, see it up here, see how it affects people, uh, uh, see how faith can intersect with that to, to markedly lessen that. A lot of times you'll hear people say, and you've had melanoma, colon, and prostate cancer, three different cancers, that cancer is often, this is what people say, caused by stress. Is that possible? And if it is, is your stress level too high? Oh, I don't think my stress level's too high, and I don't. I don't believe that. <clears throat> you know, w w we all have cancers in us every day. That we have uh, what's called D-dimers that go in and clip them and and clean them up. I just don't have really good genes. I don't think it has anything to do with stress. It it has to do with, and I don't have long life expectancy on my side of the family. When did your father die? Sixty-two. Of what? Uh, of, of a combination of things. On that note, we are out of time. Senator Tom Coburn, thank you for joining us. Good to visit with you. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.